Okay, welcome to the Legal Networking Forum. I'm Christine Mantillo with South Coast College. The Legal Networking Forum brings education, local resources, and connections to the community. My guest today is Mark Peacock. Mark, tell us about you. Let's hey, begin. Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, having me here. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Mark Peacock. Jeremiah is my middle name. Uh, I'm a lawyer here in Newport Beach. We have, I also have an office up in um, uh, Sacramento. And we represent uh, law enforcement, uh, fire uh, corrections, basically all kinds of safety, you know, you know, parole, probation, anything like that in civil in civil matters throughout uh, California. So that's that's what I do. And I, you know, I went to law school in Santa Clara, good old Santa Clara back in the day. Um, and yeah, that's what I do. I, I have an undergrad degree in uh, English literature, which I uh, I really hold uh, very close to my heart. That's uh, uh, I enjoyed that part of my life probably a little bit more than the other parts of my life, but uh, yeah, that's that's it. All right, so now yeah. I'm taking you back back. Okay. What made you want to become an attorney? Did you know before college? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Uh, my journey to law school, uh, it was, I mean, it was unique for me. I don't know if it's unique for other people, but for me, I didn't really know, I didn't really have any idea of going to law school or anything like that. And I, uh, I, even my undergrad degree, uh, that's probably where it begins. If I could go back, if you don't mind if I tell that part of what it, yeah. um, basically I went back to school. I bounced around, uh, junior colleges like crazy. I didn't really, I had no idea what I wanted uh, to do at all. I actually wanted to be like a lead guitarist in a rock band and, and two earth of stones or something that never uh, materialized. <laughs> it's still up here though. Up here on Friday and Saturday nights, I You're go to the plane, right? I still play. And here I have these fantasy concerts in my house where I'm jamming super loud. So those that that does happen. We realize our dreams is the point. Okay. But I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I got into I finally my I I met this uh, a man who's really my mentor. Uh, his name is Pete. And Pete uh, uh, was just a wonderful guy. He's since passed away, but he really helped me get focused on uh, what I what I'm going to do with my life. And uh, so I, he kind of mentored me to go back to college, which I did, or actually mentored me to get more focused in college, which is what I did. And that's when I started uh, with my English uh, literature degree, which really started everything and opened up all kinds of things in my life, in my heart, in my head, and everything that I didn't. I knew it kind of was there, but I didn't know what it was. And then suddenly I'm in college and, you know, reading like the Hemingways and the Conrads and the Kafkas and the Shakespeare's, and all these the writers, and I was connecting with them. No idea that that was ever going to happen. And suddenly that's happening. And my world began to expand and grow and get bigger. And the, the reason why I'm saying that is because the possibilities, my, my undergrad degree, when I was going through that, you know, all of a sudden I'm, um, uh, meeting the most wacky people you could possibly imagine. Everything from poets to people who want to become uh, teachers in the English lit, English literature, that world of uh, people generally want to become teachers uh, or, you know, famous poets or writers and things. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine it was really wacky in a diverse group, which I really resonated with because they were creative and um, they were creative and they liked to explore. And they were, you could tell they were on a journey and they were kind of aware of that, but had no idea where they were going, which is where I was. Mm -hmm. And my friend Pete, his, all of his uh, family were, were all lawyers and a couple of judges in there. So he introduced me to some people in his family and I actually started dating his niece for a little bit. Uh, and they're all lawyers. And suddenly this idea of becoming a lawyer just sort of organically started migrating into my head. And uh, I just was talking with him about it one day. And he said, well, why don't you do something like that? And it was, you know, for me, like monumental. Like, I, I can't do that. And yet I did. And so I just said, okay. So I didn't have any preconceived notions about, you know, saving the world with the uh, you know, a law degree or becoming a lawyer, nor did I really think, okay, I want to become a gazillionaire and I want to make all kinds of money, which are traditionally kind of the ideas that people have going into law. I didn't have that. I was more of like, a, oh, it was more like personal. Like, uh, I'm going to challenge myself 
to go into law school. And I started visiting colleges, which was overwhelming to me because of kind of where I came from. The idea of going to a law school was just you know, fancy pants. And uh, that was like almost too much. It, but I found out that uh, when, I went, when I went to Santa Clara, which I went to law school, when I got on the campus there, I went to, my friend took me to Stanford, uh, Berkeley in a school called Hastings, uh, which is in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And these were all overwhelming to me. Like, I, I don't belong here. I don't belong here. And my friend, uh, if you could bear with me for a second, it was, it was very uh, wonderful for him to do this uh, for me. And I'm not sure exactly why. The universe just kind of does this. Uh, if you ask for guidance, kind of delivers in this way. He, we were standing on, on Stanford on the campus and uh, at the law school. And I don't know if you've ever been to Stanford. It's overwhelming to me because I felt like I didn't belong there. I didn't qualify. These people were too intelligent and, you know, they were just positioned better than I ever would be. And uh, really it was a, a sense of, uh, you know, self-esteem and the sense of not be, feeling worthy and things like that. And I remember we, I started to cry and I said, I don't, and I got mad at him, like, stop taking me to places like this. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't belong in a place like this. And, and the, we went to that afternoon, he said, we have one more school to go to. So we drove down to Santa Clara and I don't know what it was about Santa Clara, but I, right when I got on campus, I said, oh, I can go here. I could do this. And it was like uh, all the stars lined up and um, then, then it, it was okay. So I applied. Uh, with just this sense of, hey, I'm going to go on this adventure and see where it goes. I didn't really have these fancy ideas of, of being like a big corporate lawyer or even, you know, a civil rights, you know, fighting for the little guy lawyer. I didn't have any idea what it meant. So that's how I kind of landed in law school. And even in law school, it was really a, a time for me to really uh, bloom because suddenly, um, you know, you get, uh, you get challenged in law school uh, in very, very unique ways. They basically treat you or teach you how to think critically. And most people don't do that, I have found. That's my experience in life. And, the, and to think critically uh, became, uh, you know, something I, uh, that really resonated with me. It was easy for me or easier. Not that uh, I'm not comparing myself to other people, but for me personally, it became easier for me to do that by sort of internally. So that's how I got. Through. And then even with getting through law school, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I, I had a, a friend of mine from high school. He worked as a lawyer up in Orange County. And he said, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll get you a job. So I got a job and started doing construction work. I had no idea what I was doing. I just uh, just went at it. I um, In that, I... You want to hear all this stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So from you're there, like everyone I, peeking in your life wants to hear it. <laughs> yeah. So from there, I uh, started working uh, for a construction law firm. Uh, we did construction defect, which is, you know, soul deadening <laughs> work. It did this, and I was. That's when nail. I first was that. Yeah. Is oh, the nail God. the problem? Well, it was for me. Now, for some other people, it's not. Uh, but I. Quickly, well, I shouldn't say quickly. I began to realize, um, you know, you start looking for your calling or what are you doing and the questions of, you know, the purpose of life, the meaning of life, and those sorts of things start creeping or started creeping in my head. Like, what am I doing? And it is, you know, what does it mean to work? And, you know, everybody gets focused on making money and getting a house or getting a car. And those are certainly important things. However, it became this, this, this sort of, uh, what do they call it, like a, a wheel with a mouse on it or whatever. And I, I yeah, exactly. And I, um, I remember doing one, what was it? It was one uh, case, construction defect case, and we got we prepared for trial. And I literally took, you know, 200 depositions. I thought I was saving the world. I was driving all over the place. I, uh, you know, I was taking these, I was doing all kinds of work. I was working 80 hours a week and then we're right up to trial, right about to start trial. And the, and we went to a settlement conference down in San Diego 
and I had all the information up here in the noggin and all the boxes and everything and everything. I, I'd done all this massive amount of work. And then the case settled in about three hours and everything I had done, it, it was very clear that nothing mattered from my perspective. And not that it was about me. I was thinking about all the homeowners, the depositions of all these people, none of it really mattered. And then I, I realized that, okay, this is just an environment where the insurance companies are don't want to pay and you, we have to create something to force them to pay. And the something was me doing all this work and a couple other guys in the firm doing all the work. And then you realize this is all soulless. It's, it's soulless. So all the money went from the insurance companies. The attorneys made money, not me. The, uh, some of the attorneys on the other side made money. The experts made money. The money was supposed to go to the homeowners to help with their defects and their properties. And a very small amount of it wound up with the homeowners. So all the money went to the insurance company or the lawyers, the experts. And I, I thought that is not something that resonates with me. And I know that's business and, and uh, capitalism and stuff like that, but it didn't resonate with me and I, at all. And I got, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And it just felt soulless. So I began a process of getting out of doing that. And I found uh, a job outside of law, uh, which I was a little bit disheartened with at this about two or three years into it. But I uh, just through a series of luck, got a job with the plaintiff's firm, plaintiff's attorney up in Los Angeles. It was rather famous. Um, and uh I took the job, which was at a, a severe pay cut, but it was, uh, that was the best thing I ever did. And the guy's name was Mike Pews. Mike was a, a plaintiff's attorney uh, who went on, if, uh, he like took on the tobacco industry and got a $5 billion verdict or whatever it is he got. And he would take on these, these huge cases where and nobody would want the cases because they were too difficult. And the, and the opponent was always you know, an auto manufacturer like Ford or General Motors or Toyota. And the clients, uh, we were representing people all of a sudden, by the way. Mm -hmm. So the clients were always severely injured. And so that resonated with me. Uh, suddenly I found myself uh, helping people out. So when I was, when I'd be, uh, you know, doing a law, when I'd come in and I'd do all that work that I did for the construction companies before, I was doing the same amount of work for, but now it's for people. And the people you know, they call and they, their lives have been, you know, how this is their lives are completely disrupted. And, you know, they've been, typically been injured and we represented people who were severely injured from everything from amputations to paralysis, mm -hmm. to all kinds of very bad injuries that are life changing and they don't just end when the case ends, they go on forever. So I started resonating with these people and I would, you know, I would go meet with them and help them through depositions and things like that. And that really, I could tell I was, that this, this was for me. And if, if you look at it, like the bottom of my email, I have this thing about David and Goliath. And, and I say, this is me And that, not that I'm David, <laughs> however, that ethic or that, that, that energy, that is what I resonate with. And I aspire to, to do that. And I aspire to help people out, uh, and uh, that that be that's when it became really like second nature for me. Like, okay, this is it, not so much a job; it became a career. And really, ultimately, uh, where it's landed me is I've represented thousands of people, um, and and to help them out, and that that that's a do gooder <laughs> that I resonate with uh, tremendously. I could have made a lot more money doing staying in the construction defect world, but there's, it's a soulless life for me, it's for me, the other people, not so much, but, but, uh, for me, uh, that's, uh, that's how I, that's how I wound up going to law school and why I do what I do. <laughs> and you know, it's really interesting on that. Uh, I could interrupt myself <laughs> on that. It's funny how, where life takes you because, um, and if you, just allow life if you just trust the universe and you ask the this, this is the hippie in me coming out if you ask the universe 
uh, and I say universe, by the way, just to be, uh, uh, you know, universe to me is God. It's uh, whatever is that uh, that is that inspires you, and uh, and that can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. I use the word universe, but it, uh, it's sort of, so it's sort of politically correct to do it like that. However, I, I believe that very uh, intimately. If you ask the universe for something, it, it, it will deliver it. And so I began representing people and I enjoyed that. And I was working for this, uh, this guy, Mike Pugh's up in LA and, and I was involved in the OJ Simpson case. We represented um, the estate of Nicole Brown Simpson. They got to know uh, Nicole Brown Simpson's parents who have since passed away, but during all that, this is going back a few years, but the OJ Simpson case was really like dynamic and, you know, being on TV and all that fun stuff as a young lawyer was very profound. And I remember, if I could tell you a war story, you want to hear a war story? All right. So I remember um, uh, representing OJ Simpson, uh, not rep representing the estate of Nicole Brown Simpson and having in my heart very clearly that these two parents lost their daughter. And if you think of that, that in a vacuum, and if you have kids, I know you have two kids. If you think about that, if one of your kids is taken from you, is killed, is murdered, what would that feel like? And not, I mean, forget about all the, you know, the celebrity of OJ Simpson, just Mr. and Mrs. Brown and their daughter. And then I never met uh, Nicole Brown Simpson's uh, sisters, but they were involved. They lost their sister. And then you have the Goldmans, if you remember the, what happened. Yeah. In the and Mr. Goldman lost his son. And he was very, very emotional about it. And, you know, when you're sitting there and you represent these people like this in this, those kinds of environments, and you get to know them outside of, of the lights, outside of the cameras, outside of the newspapers and all that, <laughs> pardon me and you get to know them personally it's it's rather dramatic and profound and then you realize okay this is very very important it, not just to go get money there's a sense of fairness there's a sense of uh, a need for closure or something they're on a journey and you're helping them through this part of their journey and it, that resonated with me like crazy. And uh, so I was uh, involved in that case. And here's the worst story. I we were taking the deposition of, what was her name? Uh, Paula uh, Barbieri, who was uh, O.J. Simpson's uh, girlfriend at the time. And he had just been acquitted uh, of, of the murder like uh, a couple months before. So we're taking a, a deposition and he came, came walking in. And he sits down at the table in the deposition and I was staring at right across from me, you know, and I was staring at him and I don't know how old he was, maybe 55 or something like that. Uh, and he'd just been acquitted of the murder. Now I, I have my opinions uh, based on facts <laughs> on whether or not he did it. Um, and I'm sitting there looking at him thinking that this man, wow. And I went to the restroom, uh, to use the restroom and he came in and he was talking to me um, uh, and it was really, I was looking at him thinking, you know, you, it, you know, there's a lot of people who firmly believe you killed two people. Yeah. And I didn't say it to him. I was staring at him. He was right here, right talking to me. And uh, he's trying to help me with some questions to ask Paula Bar Barbieri. Uh, like, yeah, you should ask her about this. Some, I forgot what it was, like something about the timing. When, you know, when I opened the window, what time was that? You should ask her that. And, um, uh, you know, it was a really interesting moment because I'm thinking, you know, what about Mr. and Mrs. Brown? Uh, they, they're at home right now down in Southern California and Orange County and they missed their, their daughter. And uh, that really, uh, that whole experience um, that, by the way, is, in some degrees, continues to this day with, with Simpson. That, uh, that really uh, uh, moved me because, uh, you know, there are a lot of attorneys. And we went back to the room where the deposition was going on. There were a lot of attorneys in the room who were enjoying the spotlight of the moment. They were on the cameras all the time, plaintiff's attorneys and defense attorneys. And they were more 
interested in getting uh, advancing their own careers. You could tell they were, you know, it's a moment I'm in the papers, I'm getting quoted and I'm going to, people are going to start sending me cases and things like that. And that really never really, uh, is, you know, not holier than thou. However, that, that never really resonated with me like that. I was more thinking, oh my God, there, this, this poor gal and this poor guy, Ron Goldman, they were murdered, murdered and slaughtered like, like animals. And uh, it was really sad to me. And that prompted me, now I look back, that, that prompted me to keep going with what I was doing. So that is that case and other cases like that, uh, by the way, not just that, that one was just rather dramatic, but mm -hmm. there were other, many other cases where people were paralyzed and things like that, that, that prompted me, this is what I want to do. I want to continue helping these people out um, because you can change their lives or if not change their lives, I shouldn't say that. That's not actually, I don't, I don't believe I could change. I could help out and the helping could help uh, change the course of life. Yes. So primarily, you know, it's getting not just money for people, but it, it gives them opportunities, creates opportunities, not just for them, but they're for their families and things like that. So then that's when I opened my own law firm with one case. I'll never forget it. I thought I was going to save the world with one case. <laughs> and that one, that case went flat, by the way, it was funny. Uh, but I somehow survived in a, and I just kept going. And uh, that's what that's, that started all that kind of sprang me if you will into uh representing people and the universe uh answered that calling sort of by uh a friend of mine who i went to law school with uh just happened to start representing uh correctional officers just by luck one time and he started calling me saying hey can you help out with some of these cases which led me into this world of safety and um i had you know i don't have any police officers or firefighters or, or anybody, any first responders in my family that I'm aware of. Um, and so it was, that was kind of a brand new area for me. However, again, I was, we were representing these first responders who got injured doing their jobs. And a lot of them, you know, they're helping people out. They're saving the kid from drowning and they get bonked on the head. So it, it, it was a natural fit for me. To, to help these people out in those uh, kinds of environments. So there you go. That's the story of my life. <laughs> Actually, it's sort, sort of not done there. Okay, that's it. <laughs> so there wow. you go. Give me, give me some stories. Give me some stories about safety. Uh, yeah, there's a ton of them. Uh, as you know, there's a ton of them. <laughs> Representing uh, safety, uh, I represent safety in um, civil actions. So primarily when they get injured um, by other people, not just uh, they get injured on the job, but they get injured by other people. For example, like an automobile accident, that's a typical one. If a police officer is, we call it rolling code. So they have the lights and sirens going and they're going to save the day and you everybody sees them but nobody stops you guys should stop in the intersections and let these cops and, and firefighters by it's amazing by the way i was just uh at an intersection a couple of days ago and these two huge fire trucks were coming through it's big engines and there were lights and sirens for half a mile away and nobody stops <laughs> like guys you got to let these people do their jobs and uh by the way not to be all preachy that, that you know you the firefighters doing that, I was thinking, uh, you know, there might be somebody's grandma or grandfather having a heart attack right now, and they need to get there fast. So get out of their way, man. Or maybe somebody's two-year-old kid is drowning and needs CPR. Get out of their way. Uh, and it's funny how selfish and self-centered people behave, including myself. I'm not some angel on it. When these emergency vehicles are trying to go through traffic, it's, it's, it's curious to me yeah. uh, that people uh, do that. Anyway, there's my Great preaching. Point, Great point. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, I don't, I don't like that. <laughs> so on behalf of my clients, stop doing that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, uh, I have a ton of stories on uh, representing uh, 
safety guys. Primarily, it's uh, the the bigger ones are you know officers or firefighters or correctional officers who get injured to the point where they have to retire. And when they have to retire, it's rather a lot of times our system is set up that the um, let's just use a, a correctional officer. You know, people, by the way, will want to call them, oh, yeah, prison guard. No, they're not prison guards. That's a that's a Hollywood description. They're correctional officers. These are officers of the state of California. And we ask them to do a rather difficult job, which is uh, housing the criminals. And our the state of California has got uh, an incredible population of uh, inmates. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole different discussion about that. However, that's what they do. They actually... And so it's a vulgar to say it like this. They, they warehouse human beings who've committed crimes. Uh, and that's a very difficult uh, thing to do. And a lot of these criminals, if you've ever been inside an actual prison, not a jail, but a prison, uh, you know, that's a, a very unique and depressing and horrible environment. So people, by the way, will oftentimes say things like, Oh, yeah, you know, they're having like, you know, they get to go to prison for like a year and have, you know, it's easy and they get their three meals a day and they get to work out all the time and they get all the medicals and stuff like that. Some of that might be true that they, they do get uh, three meals a day and they do get free medical and they do get to work out all the time. But the, the meals are uh, bologna sandwiches <laughs> and, uh, you know, so they eat, you know, they, they don't eat well and they, they don't, you know, it's gang activity and gang environments and they're housed with other fellow criminals. So it's, it's very, very horrific. Uh, and, you know, the people that I represent have to warehouse them. And that's my word. And it's, it's very, very uh, traumatic, not just uh, doing that, but psychologically for clients and in their heart, it's hard for people uh, to do that uh, with other fellow human beings. And that's, that's just the truth. Not saying that they shouldn't be in prison. It's just, it's difficult. So representing these, uh, the folks who do this for a living, they generally tend to be, uh, you know, a certain group of type of people who like, who do that for a living. And that's their careers. So a lot of these people will come from military backgrounds and you know, they get out of the military, they want to become a police officer. And if that doesn't work out or if they, or they just choose to become a correctional officer, they have that kind of background. So a lot of them uh, are military. And so they like structure and they like uh, things like that. And it, so when something happens where they get injured, um, you know, most people don't realize this, but if they can't do their job, you know, oftentimes uh, the system tells them, this is what actually happens all the time. The system tells them, you can't do it anymore. So the reason that's important for, uh, for how I'm describing this is a lot of times these people with their type of backgrounds, they love what they do. This is their identity and their life. So they go home, they tell everybody, I'm an officer. I you know, serve and protect society, which they do. And that's they have not just this career where they provide for their family, but they have an identity that, that they have, you know, we're, a lot of times people are like, what am I going to do with my life kind of thing? They've answered that question, so to speak. And when they get injured to a certain point, the system, the state, the county, the city, whoever their employer is, but if it's a correctional officer, it's going to be a state, will tell them, hey, you can't physically do it anymore. So we're going to retire you. Now, there is one that is, uh, if you can imagine if you're 30 years old, 40 years old, 45, you're, so you're young, and you have this career going, you have an identity going, you've been providing for your family and kids, and you're sort of the hero and provider of the family. And suddenly the system, the, your employer, the state is telling you, you can't do it anymore. And you go, no, I actually, I, I want to do it. Like, yeah, sorry, you can't do it. So they, boom, they retire, they force you to retire. And these guys, uh, gals, they, you know, they, they can very easily and oftentimes fall into a, a a sort of a cycle of, of uncertainty um, and they, they don't know what to do and they almost become victimized uh, by the system and they just bounce around. They suddenly at age 40, 45, whatever it might be, have to get re-educated and have to you know, go on tour with people down in Ecuador, stuff like that. All of a sudden, boom, they have to come up with some new, what am I gonna do with my life? 
Um, and it, that's, that's when these cases get more challenging and they also provide more opportunity uh, for us here at the firm to uh, help them and help their family through those, uh, through those moments. One in particular, this guy, Dan, uh, been, he was a correctional officer up in North Kern State Prison and his family, I forgot exactly, but his like dad was a sheriff up there, his uncle was a sheriff, something like that. He had law enforcement in his family. So he, Dan had a complete identity of, you know, I'm gonna become a correctional officer. He was in the army, then, then uh, became a correctional officer and got into an, a, a rather small auto accident that hurt his knee and not necessarily that like tragic of an injury, but it led to him being forced to be retired. And I'll never forget, I was in San Jose at the mediation and Dan, who's, you know, man, stud, you know, and he, uh, all of a sudden he broke down right in the mediation. He started crying. Uh, and it was, my, it was early on in my career in representing safety. And, uh, you know, we, uh, at that point, I'd say I, I was kind of forgetting a little bit or naive is probably a better word, uh, that these are people too. The, these are officers, not all like just studs with no feelings. They're actually, you know, Dan started crying and I remember uh, hugging him and um, he uh, told me uh, in, through his tears that his dad was a, a sheriff. He was a sheriff. Was, my dad was a sheriff and my uncle, his uncle, I forgot what his uncle was, I think a sheriff as well up in Tulare County. And he said, you know, I, this is what I am. And now they're kicking me out. And he's, he went on to become a plumber, by the way, but he, I realized, oh my gosh. And the, this, uh, so it's not, I think my point is at that moment, um, it wasn't, a, the system was kicking him out. He's a human being doing a tough job. And uh, he didn't know what he was going to do with his life at all. He had uh, Valerie's wife and he had a, a kid. Who, I forgot how old his son was at that time. But suddenly, I'm mean, you know, looking at this guy, he's I think, probably around 35-ish, somewhere around there, and his whole life was changing. Now, you know, he wasn't dying or anything like that. However, his whole, you know, the life that he had had that was super, super, very important to him was coming to an end rather abruptly, uh, and he had no control or influence on it. So getting him the money that he got helped him bridge from that moment into his next career. So he was fortunate to have that. However, it, it, the, the whole thing had nothing to do with money. I mean, it, it did, I, you know, I get the money was, was good for him. Myself. But the bigger picture for me was, oh my gosh, this guy is, his whole life has been disrupted and I'm part of the process to help him. And so that personalized it for me and highlighted uh, how serious it was, Peacock. Pay attention to what you're doing with these people. And I have uh, sometimes to uh, the aggravation of people even who work for me or with me, uh, you know, I get a little ramped up about helping people out. Like, you don't understand these people, they have transitioned. It's a lot of attorneys and people I know will, would say, well, well, Dan just, he got a, a ton of money. So why feel sorry for the guy? I mean, he's got a lot of money or whatever. That's not how it resonates with me. And that's, that's, I'd say that's, you know, a lot, and I don't know if that's good or bad. It just doesn't, that's not how it re resonated with me. So I started building my career uh, uh, on that. And then the hair started going out. I'm like, I'm just going to be myself. And uh, you start uh, connecting with people more authentically. And if you're connecting with them more authentically, and when I say, when I say people, by the way, I mean, law enforcement, fire police, mm -hmm. uh, first responders. And I, and then I've been able, I have built my career on, 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 on that approach and to, and I very much enjoy uh, representing the individual, not the institution. Representing the institution is soulless. And, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't want to do that. <laughs> so if I have an opportunity, if I have an option, I won't do that. <laughs> so you're part of their healing process yeah okay i'll, I'll take that's nice of you to say like that yeah i i mean 
I would hope so, but I don't, uh, I would hope so to a certain degree. I don't think of it like uh, that's a, yeah. that's a way to putting it, but yeah, I well, hope so. I can think of a few clients that would say that. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, yeah, and I stay, as you perhaps know, I, I stay in contact with uh, all my clients. Mm -hmm. I don't think of them as, you know, marketing pods that are going to send me cases down the road or something. I think of them as like human beings, and I, I still, I, I'm still very much in contact with Dan and Valerie, who I represented 20 years ago. I'm still, rep you know, I represent, I just represented somebody in their family not too long ago, but I stay in contact with them because it's like a community almost. It's mm -hmm. a, uh, so yeah, that's how it, that's, that's how I do it. <laughs> but there's a lot of, there are a lot of examples uh, like that. And it's, it's safety, especially the last couple of years, by the way, with COVID and everything, um, and especially law enforcement in the last couple of years, they've been under an enormous amount of, uh, attack um, and uh, you know the role in society and you know there's been some rather infamous cases George Floyd and that sort of thing um, that socially they've been um, you know attacked and you know some of it I, I get I understand that the need to constantly evolve and improve on what, what we as a society are doing and that involves policing it also involves, you know, firefighters. It involves corrections and probation, and you know, running a, uh, you know, a school and running a law firm. Everything constantly needs to get to improve. We got these plant-based drinks. Everything constantly. We want to constantly be improving, right? So policing is in there too. Everything needs to be uh, improved. I, I get that, and. A, there was a season where in the last couple of years where they were uh, the law enforcement really was under a, a, a quite a bit of attack and um you know uh, without taking uh, like some political position on that right now mm -hmm. i you know i experienced that and uh you know there are a lot of very very good people who work in law enforcement mm -hmm. and um i mean the vast majority of them are very good people and they they do their jobs for a lot of the uh ways that like i was describing dan they do it because it's in their blood in their family in their ethic in their virtue and they're very very good people and you know in helping them through you know the last couple of years has been uh unique and uh, challenging and, uh, um, uh, you know, it's been rather satisfying, even though the outcomes aren't always what you want. Um, uh, it's still, you know, it, it feels good to help them, <laughs> so to speak. So there you go. <laughs> so then tell me a little bit about Mark, the rock star. <laughs> <laughs> tell me about Safety Heroes. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, uh, I know some people in the rock and roll world. <laughs> um, and uh, I play a little guitar. <laughs> Look at I'm blushing. Look I can't <laughs> bring, bring your guitar. Where's your guitar? Oh, I got it. You want me? Want me to do it? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, I mean, before we started here, I was blasting some music and stuff. Yeah, I have, uh, I, I play music. I, you know, if you came to my house, you'd see the, you know, I've got a music room with all gear and stuff like that. So on my gravestone, it's going to say, yeah, I am going to have a gravestone, by the way. It's not going to say lawyer. It's going to say, you know, rock star. And then lawyer. <laughs> yeah, maybe in parentheses. Hey, eh, he's a lawyer too. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the safety hero stuff and, uh, and music, uh, you know, it's it kind of an interesting uh, uh, evolution of that because I knew some people in the music industry and I would go see it's Ted Nugent. Uh, so I go see uh, like Ted in particular. I know he's going to love if I say his name here. <laughs> um, you know, but I, you know, you go, uh, yeah, you met him, you, uh, uh, but like that was kind of an interesting uh, opportunity to sort of marry uh, some different worlds into one. So I was enjoying, you know, meeting all these rock and roll uh, people that I used to admire and things like that. I play music. So I like, I like that very much. I, I collect guitars a little bit. And so it's all, that's all fascinating to me and everything. And uh, I was challenged. He said, well, you know, instead of bringing some drunk friends behind the backstage, why don't you 
do something like uh, you, you represent all these police officers want to bring them, you know, do a fundraiser or something. Yeah. And that along with a, a, uh, that is sort of evolved to something like, you know what, I'll start doing that. And then suddenly I'm like, well, who do you raise money for? And at that time I was representing uh, six kids uh, the Gonzalez kids, six kids whose dad was a correctional officer out in Chino State Prison, and, and Manny Gonzalez, and right here mm -hmm. on my desk to this day. I don't know if you can see that. God bless him. Uh, he, uh, uh, Manny was uh, uh, killed, uh, was attacked and stabbed to death by an inmate, um, and it was horrible. It was an absolutely unbelievable uh, situation that, you know, people think that, by the way, that correctional officers are stabbed and killed all the time. They're not. So they, for an, a correctional officer to be stabbed and killed at, at, in the prison is actually not as common as people think. Very dramatic uh, and horrifically horrible uh, for the family to go through. And also uh, the community, the correctional officer community. So that, so that, so in Manny's case in particular, I represented six kids. Now they're all minors and, um, and they're all, I'm still connected with them. Very close with Mark, with two of the sons uh, who Mark went on to become, he's an officer, a uh, police officer now in Southern California. But the reason I'm bringing that up in the rock and roll world is I literally sat down one day, like, okay, I want to, I just settled that case and which was, I'd say the Gonzalez case more than any other case in my career uh, was the most uh, profound and emotional for me because uh, it, it, I represented six kids mm -hmm. and they did not care about any money. They cared about their dad. And I had a little boy at the time. Uh, he's now a, a young man, but it, and it really uh, resonated. I can get like teary eyed right now talking about it. <laughs> funny. Uh, it really, really uh, profoundly impacted me because I represent these kids. A lot of them were my son's age. And people say that, um, but if you have kids, you understand that. And uh, I, uh, they didn't, I remember I, I sold the case and we're outside at the federal courthouse in downtown LA. And uh, the, all the kids were hugging me. These are all the kids, and they were, uh, and they just wanted their dad back. They didn't care about the money. They didn't care about any of it. They just wanted their, their dad back. And in the midst of all that, there's a lot of uh, uh, press and, and that kind of stuff going on. All these people, again, is like the uh, OJ Simpson case. All these people, again, when I say people, I mean uh, people connected with uh, professionally, uh, like with the correctional officers, politically, all the way up through Sacramento, Everybody, they were almost profiting in some weird way off the death of this officer. Like they were using his death uh, for political reasons. Now I understand that the there's a positive to that. So some, you know, the Buddhists say if one man dies, another can live, something like that. So there were changes that were effectuated because Manny Gonzalez was mm -hmm. murdered. Those a lot of those changes are good. So there is good with the political system and doing that, I get that. However, it did seem that there were a lot of people who were profiting in other ways. I don't necessarily mean money. I just mean like they were using uh, his murder at, to advance their careers or their positions and things. And they would say things in conversations. Uh, I, re I remember some up in Sacramento, I'm not gonna reveal who they were with. However, in this record, like you, they were talking about it as if they were involved in the case. And I wanted to say things like, you didn't even involved in the case and you're, you're talking about it as if you own it or something. And I'm sitting there in a corner in downtown LA with these six kids and they just missed their dad. And, I, and that is what really stuck with me. And that was, without a doubt, that was the most profound uh, uh, case that, I, uh, that I've ever had uh, at all. In that case, uh, you know, representing those kids like that, um, uh, that has never left me. And I still have, I still have the copy mug here and uh, stay in contact with all those guys. So, um, yeah, so there you go. So I, I was not sure what to do with it. I, I finished the case. I didn't want to let go of, the, of, of that essence of that, uh, that moment mm -hmm. I, with these kids. Um, 
And by the way, see that moment, I never forget. It was a hot, sunny day in LA and um, all these kids are all crying. And, you know, I'm crying. I'm putting on my Ray-Bans to hide my tears. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to, that was more important to me than, you know, winning a motion in the courthouse somehow. And I thought, you know, I, how do you not let go of that moment? So I went home and uh, uh, I went home and I sat down at the computer thinking, okay, maybe I'll just do like a, a you know, a site, like a memorial site. Then I started looking at, the, the, uh, there was a million of them. I go, okay, well, I don't want to put a memorial site that says, hey, always remember Manny Gonzalez. Because at, the reality is after a couple of years, people do begin to forget. And I, I didn't want to do that because it just, I, that, you know, and that felt, that didn't feel right. So I started thinking, well, what if I do, and I start going on these websites thinking, and you see them, they're all in remembrance of, in memorial sites, which are all awesome. And I just got back from Sacramento, the police officer memorial, uh, which is, we should do those. And I support those, and we do support those. Uh, you know, we go back to Washington, D.C. every year for the uh, police memorial and all that. So that, that's all extremely important. Um, and I thought, well, instead of doing a memorial site, why don't we, why don't I do a site that promotes good stories? Like, like the, an officer saving the kid from drowning or the firefighter, you know, rescuing the cat from the tree or whatever it is. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna do that. So I put in safetyheroes.com and .org. I'm like, oh, it, that back then it was like the, those webs, the name of the website was super important. Yeah. I'm like, oh, there it is, Safety Heroes. So what that did is that led me to uh, starting that website and starting that, and that led me to, hey, hey, rock guys that I know, why don't you do, I'll do like fundraisers. And then I said, okay, for, so where's the money going to go? I didn't know. I had absolutely no idea. Like, I don't know. I, this is, I, don't, I don't want the money. I, I want to raise money, do good. And the universe again floated down and said, hey, well, I got the answer for you. And Unfortunately, uh, for Emily and uh, uh, and the Santani family, they they there's two people in Orange County who were killed in Afghanistan, or they would say murdered uh, in the war. And I got to know that family, and I said, okay, in that family, uh, especially Emily Cottle, they, they were Marines, and that family, uh, the people around them said, hey, there's this uh, entity called uh, Semper Fi Fund out of uh, Camp Pendleton who were connected to Wounded Warrior Program. I didn't know what those were. I didn't, I, my dad was in the army, but I didn't know, I didn't know what these things were. And suddenly, you know, you get introduced to Semper Fi people and they're just awesome people. They're doing, they're, they're helping people out I mean, in a very profound, meaningful way. And then it just came, went from there. Then suddenly it was like, okay, now I have Semper Fi people I'm helping out. And I have this rock and roll world, and then I represent safety, and they all fit together naturally. So I would start doing these yearly uh, fundraisers, as you know, and in, uh, in raising money for, and all the money goes went and still does goes straight to Semper Fi Fund, and that is part of life's journey for me. That that has created so many opportunities um, to continue to help people the best I can, and it, it all fits naturally. Uh, for me. So I'm very, very uh, blessed and very, very fortunate to, uh, to have been on the journey that I've been on and helping people out. I never, you know, it's really funny. I know, Christine, this is going to sound kind of dorky, maybe. But I never really think of, uh, you know, you got bills to pay, you got to pay rent and, you know, pay salaries, make sure everybody's taking care of it, things like that. And I never really think uh, uh, too heavily of, about the money. I always think of like, oh, what's this going to mean for them? Yeah. them being the, the people I'm helping out. The money always, you know, uh, so for me being a lawyer, it's not about making money. It's about helping people out. The money, you can make money doing a million other things. You know, you could be, a, it's like a stage manager for uh, like a famous singer or something like that. You know, do stuff it like always that. always seems to come back. It does. Mm -hmm. So you guess what? If you do the right thing, if you got the right thing in your heart and you're authentic and real about it, the universe takes care of you and provides uh, direction and opportunities as they come. That's, 
my career in a nutshell. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, that actually answers my last two questions. One, what are you most passionate about? So we know helping people, but is helping. there anything else you want to add to? Uh, uh, I would say that the, uh, even like right now, uh, in, in my career, my life, um, you know, the, you know, I'm not 21 years old anymore. You're so. not? No, okay. I know. Isn't that strange? Don't worry. Yeah, it's not blonde. <laughs> Platinum. I can't see anymore, so. Okay, there you go. Yeah, it used to be like your color hair. It used to be like that, but now it's, you know, whatever. Oh, that's funny. Uh, but, you know, for me, it, it's transitioning into, um, you know, a different uh, way to do it all. So for me, it's, you know, partnering with my uh, law partner and providing opportunity for her to develop and to mature and blossom and thrive in her way. And uh, you know, guess what? Our reach. And by doing that and taking, instead of being competitive and like, I'm going to, it's for me and uh, all, all, all these things that you, you, like a lot of my peers who do just do personal injury kind of work, they, they're just, it's chasing the dollar. It seems constantly fighting constantly. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing that, it's providing opportunities for people within my circle to thrive. And if you do that, it's, a, it's, it may, this may sound a little dorky. It, it, for me, it's rather profound to be able to be part of a process for other people's journey. Because other people, if you could be part of a process, even if it's small, they, they begin to thrive as a human being. And when you have the right people around you, like right now, like my crew, if you will, they're not really mine, but I'll call them my crew. Uh, they're, the, they're fantastic. Uh, they're just absolutely, they're wonderful people. They care. We just had a firm meeting before we started here. And I barely said anything. And it was it, because they're all caring about the clients and, and to, for me to be able to export to that, that to them and for them to, to you know, export it back in, in their way and they thrive at that. I, I do feel a little fatherly. I don't know if that's the right word, grandfatherly. <laughs> to, to see them like thrive and, uh, and provide a safe and nurturing environment for, the, for, uh, for my crew if you will. And that helps with the client base. And guess what? All of a sudden, the universe has said, hey, P-Head, guess what? You get to open up a, a I think it's better if you open up a, a, an office up in Sacramento. So I'm like, you know what? Let's do it. So we flew up to Sacramento and uh, opened up an office right before the first of the year. And uh, so suddenly the reach of what we're doing is becoming more, it's bigger and bigger and bigger. Awesome. And so, uh, yeah. And it, you know, the, you know, the, like the last thing I'm, I'm super passionate about which is probably numero uno, it is numero uno in my life is my son mm -hmm. and to see him flourish and uh, to, you know, I try as best I can to always be cognizant that I'm a role model uh, for him and not just him, but everybody around him and, in my office that they, they they whether you like it or not people do look at you like your kids look at you and yeah. see how you're doing it uh and for me personally i feel uh rather honored and humbled to to be in that position for my son to show him as best i can uh how to how i do it and hopefully he can take something from that <laughs> they do you ever get those moments where you get to see him you know do something that you're just back there watching you know you've taught him he doesn't know you're watching and you watch his response. You're like, I told him that. Absolutely. I can't, awesome. I, I refuse to tell you some examples because I'm going to start crying. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the truth. I just had a, I just had dinner with him the other night and he, and uh, it was, uh, I started grinning because he was saying some uh, very deep and personal things uh, that he was going through. And uh, I said, God, you're a young man. And you're, I said, you're right on track. He goes, hey, I hate when you say that. <laughs> I go, you are though. You're, um, you, you know, everybody likes to brag about their kids. And, you know, I'm like, that's what I said to him. I go, you're still an amazing human being. I'm like, uh, that's the, the ble most passionate thing of my life is my son. There's no question about that. So there you go. That's awesome. That and plant-based foods. <laughs> Wait, bobblehead. Put your bobblehead up. I don't know. Oh, yeah, my bobble, uh, 
Yeah. I don't know who sent this to me. Somebody just sent this to me, a bobblehead, me playing guitar and stuff. That's Look at that. awesome. <laughs> Although, you know what the truth of the matter is? Huh? Is my, I guess my head is that fat. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I thought something profound was going to come out of that. No. That's, I'm like, I love that thing. I'm like, <laughs> a bobblehead. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like I'm blushing. That's uh uh yeah. Yeah, I you know I I am I I I would say Christine I I I do feel like humbled that I uh, I am really really blessed with uh my life and that the journey has been and it continues to be like really fascinating and I love helping people out. Uh uh we we're like for example, real quick, uh, I got Got a phone call this a modesto police officer 30 years old 30 years old uh he was shot um once like right here he's wearing his vest you know where it says police on it yeah shot right here right under the e in police in the his vest stopped the bullet thank god but unfortunately he also took a round in his gallbladder which resulted in him losing his leg so uh, i know is it crazy and uh, every he was issuing there was a, there was a, uh, a chase and then a search warrant and all, all kinds of crazy facts and everything. It was basically a drug house, and so you had all these uh, drug addicts in this house, and they were manufacturing and selling and everything. And so we got the call to go help him out. So we're, we're driving up there now. A lot of attorneys, by the way, and I'm not pat myself on the back, but just to illustrate the different approach. A lot of attorneys just run away from that case. Mm -hmm. You know why? There's no money in it. So a lot of attorneys go, I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't think like that. I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know well, why. I yes. And I, I often say, I don't know why I'm supposed to go see him and help him, but I'm supposed to do that. And so my partner, Megan and I, we fly up there. We go to his house. And this is a guy, a young guy, 30 years old. I, I talked to him on the phone in the hospital. And he'd been out of the hospital for about a month or so. And, um, you know, we're, we drive up to his house. He's married. He has a little girl just turned two years old. And his dad is also a police officer, just retired. His dad and mom are at the house. So, I, you know, we're driving up. It's very serious. This is a young man, lost his leg. Um, this horrible environment, all that stuff. We walk up. And we're all, Megan and I are all very serious. And we walk up in uh, on this doormat. We knock on the door. We look down the doormat. It said, uh, "Give me a minute. I'm busy putting on my leg," which was very funny. And then you go, "Okay." And so he opens the door, and it's this big guy. I'm six four, and he's probably six five. And he's, he's this big hearted guy answers the door, and he comes limping up, opens the door, like, "Hey, what's going on?" So he let us into his world, and all of a sudden we're at this table in this very difficult environment where he's going to get forced retired he doesn't know what's going to happen next he now is changing his whole house into a you know an ada approved a disability mm -hmm. approved house there and and i'm sitting there and he doesn't realize it but i am learning from him i am gaining i'm sitting there going this is he's blessing me i'm getting from him he doesn't even real. i haven't even shared this with him yet he doesn't realize that i'm going okay so we get the facts of the case, we get in the car and we're like, okay, that was amazing. A lot of other things happen. I'm trying to make this short. I don't know if you could tell, but I have the gift of the gap. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We get in the car and the first thing we say to each other is this, I don't know how, but we got to help them out. Yeah. I didn't even know what that meant at that moment. We had no idea. And guess what happened? The universe, God's like, hey, dude, start using it. I gave you like, I gave you something here. It's called the brain. Start using it. Get creative. You know, people start reaching out. Ba 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 ba. That led to all kinds of things. Where it looks like now, guess what? We're able to help him out in a very. Uh, uh, I hesitate to say I'm proud because this deal's not mm -hmm. done yet. But I'm very, very grateful that I, go, I, I think we have something worked out for him. That's amazing. That's so incredible. That's amazing. And it's not amazing because, hey, I'm going to walk away and go buy a Maserati. Eh, it's not that. It's my, in my mind, I'm thinking that young man who's cracking jokes right now, at some point down the road, not today, not in a year, 
in 10 years, in 15 years, in 25 years, shall I say it, in 50 years, when he's 80, he'll still be alive. He still won't have his leg. He'll still be dealing with it. He's going to have back problems, shoulder problems. He's going to have all kinds of problems for the rest of his life. And if that doesn't move you or give you goosebumps, then you're not in my inner circle. But that guy's going to deal with this for the rest of his life. So if we're able to, in a tiny way, help that or throw a, you know something in there that helps him, his wife, it's getting, hopefully they have more kids, they have bigger family, whatever, yeah. then that's a success. You know what I mean? That, if we can help him do that, something, that's a success. And then you go on to the next one. You go, oh, I don't know where that's going to take me. And you just let it, like, you know, I'd rather do that than putting my face on a bobblehead or putting, <laughs> or putting my face on a, a billboard and say, you know, I'll, you know, I, you know, I, I don't. I'm get you money. Yeah, that's that's so I'm gonna help you with your life. Yes, we're gonna do this together. Yeah, that's what I aspire to do. I don't always hit it. I aspire to do that. Right? <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Plus, I like to rock and roll, man. <laughs> well, there's gonna be people that hear this that are gonna be touched and want to know how you did it. They're gonna want to watch and they might follow in your footsteps. A lot of people think they just have to go to a firm or just do this or with this degree do that, and there's so much more. So there's, I appreciate well, you for sharing all this. Of Thank course. You. Yeah. Anytime. Of course. And where can people find you? I am. Uh, well, there's a lot of different ways that, you know, obviously the website peacockbartlett.com or they could, you know, they reach out to the office here at anytime you know, all over the internet. So your uh, office is in Newport beach, California. No, the name. Oh, Peacock and Bartlett. You want the, you want the address? Oh, no. uh, my, what do you, what do you want? Peacock Law. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's it's peacockbartlett.com. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're, it, just Google me or all or whatever. Or all. 